Now, I bet a lot of you are scratching your heads and wondering, what does he mean by that title? Well, what I mean by the curious case of Burnafly is that I'm going to provide an in-depth analysis of the movie that creeped me out when I was 9 years old, known as The Fly. The film was released in 1986, and during that time, the Reagan administration was facing many problems, which I'll explain later. The stars were Jeff Goldblum, who played the quirky scientist Seth Brundle, and Gina Davis, who played the love interest Veronica Quaif. The director was David Cronenberg, who was known for making numerous body horror films such as Rabbit, Shivers, Videodrome, and this particular film, which had an estimated budget between $9 million to $15 million, and lucky for the cast, crew, 20th Century Fox, and the exhibitors, it did really well at the box office. There was also an intriguing plot as it involved Seth slowly transforming into a fly monster within a day-to-day -day basis after a teleportation experiment had gone awry. And in order to make himself human again, he has to create another teleportation experiment while dealing with Veronica's unexpected pregnancy. Damage to the Right is the movie poster with the tagline, Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid. In the case of sci-fi genre semantics, the film has two of them. One of them is based on science labs and experiments, as Seth's warehouse acts as a laboratory while he performs teleportation experiments involving organic and inorganic matter. The other one is based on gizmos in the form of teleportation pots, as you can see in the image below. To further prove why this film is sci-fi, I now turn to Vivian Sobchak and Judith Merrill, who stated that it is speculative fiction that describes the mode which make use of the traditional scientific method to examine some postulated approximation of reality, creating an environment in which the responses and perceptions of the characters will reveal something about the inventions, the characters, or both. The main ideology that this cinema conveyed is that science can do more harm than good based on the fact that the teleportation experiment caused a mutation which led to the assisted suicide as Seth begged Veronica to shoot him with a shotgun and she had no choice but to pull the trigger. Now we transition from technological science to medical science in the form of the primary allegory, which is AIDS. Remember what I said about the Reagan administration having many problems? This is one of them. And according to Antonio Pais de la Cerda, the film portrays how AIDS patients lose control not only over their bodies, but also over their spirit. That sentiment had never been more true as Seth is portrayed as a metaphorical version of an AIDS patient, claiming that he has a disease with a purpose. Now the representation of gender is very complex as the mutation led to changes in behavior and personalities among the two people of different sexes. For instance, it caused Seth to change from a powerful, confident guy destroying support beams and breaking people's arms into a weak and vulnerable creature that can barely eat his food, which I'll get into more detail in a bit. As for Veronica, she went from an independent journalist that only thinks about herself to a mother, both figuratively and literally, as she is concerned for the well-beings of Seth and her unborn baby. In terms of sexuality, a man's aggressive sexual prowess and a woman's naive submission leads to uneasy heterosexuality, as Seth meets a woman named Tawny at the bar, who was impressed by him beating the Macho Man in an arm wrestling contest. And they attempted to have sex at the warehouse, but Seth forced her to go into the telepot, which led to a conversation about fear and Veronica quoting the famous tagline. In the case of racial representations, the film unfortunately deals with the invisible white norm based on a subliminal message of being white as the equivalent to the average human, as all of the white characters, both the major and the minor ones, have speaking roles, such as Seth, Veronica, Stathis, and an unnamed clerk. Now you're probably asking, is this movie really racist? Well, 
It all depends on how you view tokenism, because this motion picture blatantly displays it as non-white people are depicted as regular bystanders and gynecologists, like the Asian doctor consoling Veronica in a dream scene, as you can see in the image to the right. Meanwhile, the mutation represents the white majority transforming into the other, and the second teleportation experiment is Seth's way of regaining whiteness, even though that attempt completely backfired, leaving him to die as the other. Just like the representations of gender, the representations of class are a little bit tricky to comprehend, as the environment within the movie tends to be ambiguously middle class. Now the reason I said ambiguously is because there are certain elements of the setting and the characters' backgrounds that can sometimes prove to be contradictory when defining the term middle class. For example, in terms of urban living, Seth resides in a messy warehouse, while Veronica lives in an immaculate apartment with her ex-boyfriend, Stathis. Also, in terms of above-level education, Seth received a doctorate degree while Veronica majored in science in college. Lastly, in terms of professions, Seth is a freelance scientist while Veronica is a sci scientific journalist who sometimes carried around a camera. Now let's talk about artificial intelligence, AI for short. The big question that we have to answer is, what kind of AI does this flick have in store for us? Well, judging from the computerized system that operated the telepods through voice activation or typing, it is definitely the weak kind as Bernard Marr of Forbes.com elaborated that it just gets systems to work without figuring out how human reasoning works. Transhumanism, on the other hand, has a strong objection based on the loss of human identity as a result of genetic engineering by splicing the DNA structures of Seth and an unknown fly together. The side effects include the, the ability to climb on walls, which is the image you saw from the last slide, and eating food through corrosive vomit, which I have a clip of right now as he explains the process while giving the audience a gross demonstration. Take it away, Mr. Brundlefly. Must chronicle the life and times of Brundlefly, don't you? At the very least, it should make a fabulous children's book. You seem time. You got me there? How does Brundlefly eat? Well, he found out the hard and painful way that he's very much the way a fly eats. His teeth are now useless because although he can chew up solid food, he can't digest it. Solid food hurts. So, like a fly, Brundlefly breaks down solids with a corrosive enzyme, playfully called vomit drop. He regurgitates on his food, it liquefies, and then he sucks it back up. Ready for demonstration, kids? Here it goes. Oh, my God. My God. To conclude this analysis, we must now take a look at how this motion picture made an impact on culture. Convergence culture, that is. One of the main aspects of convergence culture is transmedia storytelling, which is providing content to consumers through various media, such as movies, television, video games, etc. Fun fact, did you know there was a sequel to this movie? As it turned out, The Fly 2 was released in 1989 and continued the canon through a comic book series released in 2015. Now what is canon, you might ask? It is officially accepted material of an individual universe. For instance, in the beginning of the sequel, Veronica dies while giving birth, and lo and behold, the son of Brundlefly was born, and his moniker is Martin. By the way, he transformed into a fly monster twice, one time during the film's climax, 
and another time in the comic series as an outbreak caused hundreds of people to mutate into flying monsters. Thank you all so much for taking part of this lecture, and Godspeed.